I I came across you on Twitter and I just happened to see your post one day and out I'm out here in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've coached high school football one year. This was in 2016. The last couple of years I've been coaching seven on seven football. And actually last fall I coached a youth football team. And I'm going to either be okay. football or high school football this year. If it's youth level offensive coordinator, if it's high school uh, running backs coach, you know. Um, and being a strength, independent strength coach out here, I'm very big into kids getting their, getting, uh, handling their business in the classroom, doing everything right on and off the field. And coming across your post and the recruiting, and I have several kids uh, going through recruiting right now that are uh, juniors and seniors. And I thought your post was timely, man. And I felt that uh, this would make a prime time discussion. So I decided to reach out to you. Well, that's great, man. That's, that's the whole purpose behind, um, you know, my posting on social media is, is that if I can help, you know, what started out a, a small Twitter account with just some, some of my players following me, um, that started out as a, you know, a good way to communicate with the kids um, without being face to face. It started out like that. And then, and then it kind of just, you know, morphed into, you, you know, to sometimes, you know how it is, man. If you're a mentor, you're a coach, you understand it's sometimes you just gotta, you gotta say it, <laughs> you know, and you don't, That's you right. don't care who's, you don't care who's listening and who you hope more people are listening. Like, listen, this is how it is. I need you to hear this. Please help yourself, help your kids. And, you know, let's get better. Everybody get better. So, it's uh very you know like you said it's timely and i'm glad that it was timely i'm i'm glad that somebody found it useful um or it kind of hit home where maybe they had some questions about what was going on and hopefully they can you know those posts can clear some things up for them yeah you know i think it's beautiful man whenever you can find somebody that's talking about the things that you've been talking about and and that validates it and like okay uh, I don't have to say it now because this guy is saying it. I, I, you know, I know you have an extensive background in coaching. It looks like you've been coaching for like 15 or 16 years. Of, if actually, uh, Coach, why don't you introduce yourself to my audience as far as who you are, what you do, and like where you're at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, you know, Deshaun, my name is Mike Judy. Um, I'm the head football coach at Smyrna High School in, in Smyrna, Delaware. So I'm actually – as about probably as far away from you right now <laughs> as uh, <laughs> as we can get, right? Um, and you know, the Delaware. I gotta say it because there's a lot of people that have no idea where Delaware is. Um, we're about an hour south of Philly, and about an hour east of Baltimore, and it, we're the uh, the second smallest state, and we're on a peninsula over here, and uh, surrounded by water. And it's a, it's a beautiful place. I've lived all up and down the East Coast. And I was born and raised here in Delaware. And now I'm back here to raise my family. And I have been the head coach at Smyrna for, I just finished my fifth season. And I was an assistant here for seven years prior to that. And before, before I came back to Delaware, I was actually an assistant head coach and offense coordinator at a in, at a high uh, high school in, in Northern Virginia, that was extremely large, uh, three thousand plus kids in the school, just south of DC. Um, all types of kids, all types of diversity and backgrounds. It was great. I loved it. Absolutely loved teaching in that sort of environment. Um, and then prior to that, I was a strength coach with the Philadelphia Phillies, minor okay. league organization. Yeah, and uh, I was there. That now this is going way back, but this was Larry Bella's last season, and Charlie Manuel's um, last season as an assistant before he took over as as the the head man. Okay. Um, and then before that, I was at Hargrave Military Academy, which is a it's it, the program is no longer there. Hargrave is still there. It's in Southern Virginia, right on the North Carolina border. And it was a mecca of future college football players and, honestly, NFL guys. Um, it was a school – it was a prep school. 
So okay. very much like for, very much like Fork Union and Oak Hill Academy, I believe, is uh, one yes. that's more per, more pertinent to basketball. Right. It was that it, it was that school, and I was there for three years um, as a one year as the O line coach, and then two years as the offense coordinator. And that was in my young, very early twenties, and um, I had a great great experience there. Met a lot of great people. And met a lot of really, really talented kids. So we we hit we had three years there. We signed ninety Division One football players in three years. That's incredible. And the, yeah, these guys were from all over the country. Um, they were different situations, whether it's an academic issue, um, an exposure issue. Uh, honestly, um, some of them needed another year for maturity. Some of them were true high school seniors who started in their small rural high school as an eighth grader and ran out of high school eligibility at the time. So okay. they played eighth, ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade for their high school um, and then couldn't play their senior year, so they came to us. Uh, it, it, very, very wide, uh, wide variety of kids. And like I said, from all over the country, Cali, Florida, Georgia, New York, Canada, uh, we had kids from everywhere. So it, I guess the closest thing I could tell you is it was IMG before IMG was even a, a thought. I understand. Um, yeah. And, and, and then prior to that, I actually was a G, uh, grad, grad assistant at my alma mater, which was uh, Wesley College. It's a small Division three school, but it's I, a football I've heard of powerhouse. That yeah, yeah, football powerhouse. So I believe out, out there, out in Oregon, your way, you have um, – in that area, I don't know, you know, I'm not super familiar with it, but like Linfield. Linfield, Pacific. And yeah, Pacific. Yeah, um, Redland. Great program. Yeah. So we, we, it's the same level as Linfield. And uh, we played Linfield before, I believe, um, after, after my time. Um, and obviously, I went, to, I went to college at Wesley College, um, played under Where, Coach Mike Grass. At, coach? Who, where's that at? That, that's actually in Dover, Delaware, which is my hometown. Okay. Um, and I played for Coach Drass, who who passed away last spring. Um, he was a tremendous influence on me as, um, you know, as a man, as a player, and really sparked me to get into coaching. Um, he he brought me into his office my soft, the spring of my sophomore year in college, and kind of planted that seed. Like, hey, Mike, you know. Well, they just called me Judy because there were so many mics back then. Hey, Judy, you ever think about being a coach? And I just kind of like laughed, like shrugged it off a little bit. Like, oh, man, I, I don't know. You know, <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. But I just never saw myself in the same light as Coach Drass and as the other coaches. I just didn't think I was capable of it, you know. Sure. Too, maybe, maybe too selfish at the time or whatever. But just I didn't see myself in the same light. And but. You know, a couple years later, he had planted that seed, and he found a found a way to get me as a graduate assistant and uh, keep me on board. So. That's that's awesome, man. You know, yeah, man. Um, you know, looking at your post, it's almost like these could be laws to recruiting. <laughs> and you you yeah. mentioned the uh, you know visits and photo ops and i have a lot of kids out here they've been to pac-12 schools they've been to the fcs schools out here such as uh eastern washington university uh sac state to name a few portland state and you said just because you put on the uni doesn't mean they are actually recruiting you probably recruiting your stud teammate or just want to keep <laughs> relationships with your coach or school um talk to us about that man yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I know that my direct, I guess, direct uh, nature could, could possibly rub people the wrong way sometimes. Um, but I feel it's, it's just better not to mince words. And I, I don't mean that to be a shot at any kid that's going through the recruiting process. But I, I think it's really important for these young guys to understand is that when they go to a visit, to a school on a junior day, for example. And there's no football going on. They're not doing any camping. They're not running around doing drills. Um, 
you know, maybe a third of the kids that are there are actually being recruited. You know, the other guys are going into their recruiting system, but they're not going to actively recruit most of the kids there. They, you know, if they, if they bring, if they, if they have two wide receiver spots open for the 2020 class and there's 15 wide receivers there, they're not recruiting all of you. It's just that that's just the truth. And it costs them nothing to give you a name, you know, basically nothing to give you a little name, ta- name badge with your, your name on it and their logo. And it costs them nothing to allow you to put on a Jersey and take a, take a couple pictures with you. And then they send them to you. And it, it's, it makes the kids feel good, but I think it's important that the, the coach or the coaches, the players and the families um, understand that that it, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's a good opportunity for you to like, you know, <laughs> to have some pictures from Rutgers or Eastern Washington, like you were saying, and, or, uh, you know, go to Michigan and put on the, the uniform, but it doesn't mean they're recruiting you. It doesn't mean they're going to actively recruit you. And the truth of the matter is that oftentimes um, we've sent, you know, a stud kid to a major university, a power five university who they are actively recruiting and he brings two or three of his buddies with him, and maybe they're football buddies and their football buddies who are not being actively recruited by the school get all the same opportunities at junior day as he does. So they all take a tour of the facilities. They all talk to the coaches and they all get to, you know, get the photos done. And the truth is that that guy, (laughs) that, that kid that's just along for the ride could very easily get something put in his mind that like, Oh my gosh, you know, um, Rutgers is recruiting me or, or, you know, Oregon is recruiting me. They're not, they're not, they're recruiting your buddy. They're recruiting your buddy. And part of the recruiting process is for a school to win, win the kid over. They're trying to make it to really trying to show how much they care about the kid. And um, if taking care of your friends in a legal way, not costing them a thing is part of that and is going to make you the stud happy, then we're going to do it. So those are just like some observations I've had that 10 years ago, five, 10 years ago, we, I didn't see this stuff. You know, when a kid, when a kid got to a school and took a picture with the helmet on, um, it was real. It was legit. That's right. They, they weren't, they weren't allowing kids that, that they weren't recruiting to do that. So Kind of like what I said in the post is the recruiting game has evolved. It's evolved and everybody needs to know what's going on right now so that they, they can make wise decisions. I think that's what it's about too, is making wise decisions and then getting out of your emotions in terms of the feel good, you know, taking all of these trips, it it gets beyond feel good because at some point it begins to cost you gas money, lunch money, dinner money, and things of that sort on these unofficial visits, you know, now, now speaking of these visits and photo ops coach, uh, let's get into offers because, you know, you, you explained that there was once a time when an offer, it really meant something. And you stated not anymore offers mean very little until the ink is dry. And one thing that uh, we've said, schools might offer 300 kids, but might only have 80 spots. Yeah. You know, would you care to speak to this? Yeah, absolutely. You, you actually hit the nail right on the head there is that, you know, I don't know. I can't remember the exact number, but you can find just through some quick searches, you can find out, exactly how many kids in the class of 2020 that Alabama, Michigan, Arkansas, you know, the big, the big schools, how many kids they have offered. The truth is they can only take up to 25 scholarship kids per class. So they're only going to sign at max 25, 20, you know, 25, 27 kids, something like that. Right. And they can't, they can't sign all 300. And are they, but they may have extended that many offers. They may have extended two, 300 offers out there. And the offers that used to mean <clears throat> you're, you're in, you know, if they offered yes. you, you were in, you just got to graduate and get the grades and you're in baby. It ain't like that anymore. It's um, they're offering 
extending these offers and a lot of the ones that you read about on social media and the kids that are out there following, you know, they're fo- they fo- they all follow each other. Uh, you know, I've had uh, a couple division one kids over the past couple years and they all seem to find the other division one kids around the country that are in their class and they all follow each other. So for example, you know, I might have a running back that's being recruited at the mid-major, you know, the, the group of five division one level, and he's got maybe 10 offers and he's, he's linked up with these other, these other running backs and these other skill guys on social media. And he sees them, uh, you know, every day, his feed, you know, Hey, I'm very, you know, I'm blessed to get this offer. I'm blessed to get my 14th offer, 15th offer right. from different, different kids. And it starts to play mind games on them where the kid sees 14th offer, 15th offer, 17th, 20th. And he's sitting there at three. And he starts to think, well, man, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing enough. And it's the, the truth is he's being flooded by all these different kids, you know, postings. And your brain can't digest that. Your brain can't organize and compartmentalize that. So all he's seeing is offer, 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 offer. And they're not coming in to him at the same rate he's reading. So you know how humans are. We start to worry. You know, you start to, especially if you're a competitive kid, you start wondering, oh man, I'm, I'm missing out. I'm not getting enough offers. And the, and the truth is, it doesn't matter, you know, what you want. It matters what the, what the colleges want. And they're going to offer who they want to offer. But the hidden gem in all this is that half of those offers are going to disappear. You know, they offer a kid and then they never talk to him again. Um, I had, we just recently had that with one of my big linemen. I had the kid actually ended up committing to Penn state, but, um, and he ended, he was like the number five guard in the country, but he had an offer from a major FCS school, a legendary FCS school. They never once contacted me. They never once checked his GPA or his transcripts. They just saw that this kid was blowing up. And they threw an offer out there. They, they contacted him, gave him an offer, and then we never heard from him again. And the offer basically was, we are highly interested in you because you're blowing up <laughs> and we want to get you to come to our camp. And he didn't go to the camp um, because he chose not to, because they hadn't created a relationship. And they never once called him again. They never once got in touch with them. They never once talked to me. So and this is from a major university. Like, I'm not going to call them out, but it, this is a very common thing. And, uh, and <clears throat> these, some of these offers are, are non-committable, which means they'll extend an offer to a kid who hasn't qualified to even get into their school yet. Um, so it's like contingent. Sometimes the offers are contingent on you getting a thousand on your Jeep on your SAT, or it might be contingent on you, you know, you getting over a three O and they don't talk about that. Kids aren't posting that. Hey, I'm right. to have a contingent contingent offer based on my, <laughs> you know, if I get 1100 on my SATs, I'll go to the you know Naval Academy. No, they don't post that. They just say, I'm blessed to receive this or I've been offered this. And so you're getting some truth from these posts, but they don't know the whole truth. And the whole truth is kind of what's setting, what should set you free and keep, keep you, keep the kid from worrying is that right. half of these offers, half of these offers don't mean anything. Um, half of them are uh, uncommittable, which means if the kid got up, let's say, I don't know, uh, the kid's favorite school contacts him and offers him. The kid needs to find out, is this a committable offer today? Can I commit today? And if I want to, and if it's yes, then it's a real offer. If it's no, like, well, you got to come to camp. It's not a, it's not a real offer. Uh, so these are questions that I think, 
kids need to kind of prod around and ask is, you know, I got an offer from Ohio State. Is it actually committable? Or is it just an offer to get me to camp where if I perform really well, they'll let me commit? And if I don't perform well, or if I don't perform better than the other 13 running backs they offered, then, <laughs> right. then maybe it's still uncommittable and they really don't want me anymore. So that's kind of the, what I'm getting from, from this recruiting process over these years has been that, is that the, they, these offers don't mean what they used to mean. And on top of that, you know, I, it, this is a personal opinion, so I try not to post too much about it because, again, it's my personal opinion uh, and it's anecdotal, but I hate, absolutely hate when I see kids counting the offers. Yes. They, hey, uh, you know, I'm blessed to receive my eighth offer. It's like nobody, like it doesn't matter. I almost said nobody cares. People care. But I don't care how many offers you have because, again, Half of them are uncommittable or at this moment. And at the end of this thing, you're only going to pick one. That's right. Like you, 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 and you only need one that's committable. And it, so it doesn't matter if you have two or you have 30. Uh, you only need the one. And that one doesn't even matter. It's, it's legit. The committable ones are legit, but it doesn't matter until you sign. That's right. And the, and the day before signing, they could pull the offer. So it's not over. You know, they, it's, it's not over until that ink is dry. And once you sign the paperwork and send the information in, now it's a, it's a legal document. Now it's binding you and the university. And you can't change your mind <laughs> after you sign that, that, that letter, that letter of intent. Um, everything's been pushed up. Yeah, it's a contract. It's a binding legal contract. If you, if you as a player sign on the early signing day and then decide that you don't want to go to that school, you have burned a year. You cannot go to another school. You have signed a legal document. Uh, you're going to go there and either, and either play or go there and, and then transfer or you're going to sit out a year. If you don't go to that school. Correct. So, you know, the, the, the idea of commitment, you know, the, what is commitment? And I talk about that in my, in my Twitter account as well. A lot is commitment is a, <laughs> you are dedicating yourself to a cause and it, it, um, prevents a lack or it prevents a freedom of action. So when you commit to something, you are basically telling the world and the other party, that this is it and I'm not doing something else. And the legal contract will keep you from doing that other thing, which would be maybe signing with another school. Um, so yeah, so the offer thing is, is, gets a lot deeper than just getting an offer. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like that anymore. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're still in the uh, first quarter. Let's talk about mailings, coach. Coach Judy, you know, between social media, you know, kids get get bombarded with mail and not all schools will actually recruit you. We were just talking about that. But, you know, you said it costs nothing to fill out the info card and send it back. And handwritten letters mean more in terms of being able to, commun to communicate with a school, an entity, a head coach or, or recruiting coordinator or what have you. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I played high school football 20 years ago. I'm, I'm about to turn 40. So over 20 years ago, I was a right. graduate, high school graduate in 1997. Yeah, I was and, 92. Okay. So you know this as well is that yep. we got mail from, even back then, we were getting mail, hard, hard mail, because nobody had email or anything back then. <laughs> right. Uh, right. It's hard for these young guys to believe. Uh, we were getting full on letters from schools that even I, who had a pretty, pretty good idea of where I was going to play like uh -huh. uh, level wise that had no business sending me a letter. <laughs> and I can remember, I can remember one, you know, I was a division two football That's where player I was. at best. Yeah. I yeah, played at, at Portland best. State in Western Oregon later. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And, and, 
you know, I was recruited by a bunch of Division II schools and even had scholarship opportunities there. But that we'll talk about that in a little bit. Those, those scholarships at that level can be a little tricky, um, especially when, the, you know, the scholarship doesn't really truly make an impact on your financials. That's right. Um, so I ended up, up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I ended up choosing to, I got a way better deal uh, financially for me and my family to go to a division three school. So I kind of knew, I kind of knew that, all right, at best I'm a division two guy or a very, you know, I could play at a very competitive division three school like Wesley. And, um, but at the same time, I'm getting letters from, you know, UNC university of North Carolina, and I'm getting letters from Miami and I'm just like laughing. I'm laughing because I'm like, they, I can't play here. Like I'm, I'm a real realistic guy. You know, I'm six foot, I'm six foot two, 220 pounds in high school. Um, and I'm going to be an offensive lineman. Like I can't, (laughs) I can't play at Miami. You know? And, uh, so I, I was the kid that just took those letters and chucked them, threw them away. Well, there was a, you know, that was dumb on my part because the, I, you know, to get back to what these kids are going through today is these kids are getting bombarded um, with every legal way. And I, when I say legal, you know, NCAA appropriate way of a coach or a program communicating with you. If there's a legal way, they're going to do it. So they're sending, they're still sending the, the letters in the mail. They're sending posters and sending all that stuff. They're, um, you know, messaging or getting a hold of kids through through social media, um, well, and vice versa. The kids are contacting them. Um, so they're going to get bombarded by these schools. And it's important, just like it was 20-some years ago, to understand that just because you receive a, a mailing from somebody, from a school, it doesn't mean they're re- actually recruiting you. But it really, they sent the mail. And they sent the return postage um, card, you know, that says, please fill out this information. I encourage the recruits to do that, um, you know, because it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time, five minutes to fill out the card and send it back. Um, postage is already paid for, so you don't even have to buy a stamp. And just send it back. And you'll go into the recruiting database. It still doesn't mean they'll recruit you if, if you're not a division one football player, they're not going to recruit you, but you, you know, it's kind of like somebody gave you a free lottery ticket, you know, who, who knows what could happen if they know who you are and, and you meet the, the needs of their school. And maybe, maybe you're not a D one player right now, but what happens if there's a lot of growth, you know, what happens if between your sophomore and junior year, you, you you genetically blow up. Well, all of a sudden you go from a division three division two player to a, to a FBS or FCS player because you grew three inches, you know, or you got extremely fat, you know, you're, you're all of a sudden learned how to run, learned how to sprint. So I, I encourage the kids to understand they're going to get bombarded and that doesn't necessarily mean they're being actively recruited right now. But what it does mean is you've been given an opportunity to provide them with your information and you should not, Uh, shrug it off, you know, like I did. You should fill that card out, send it back. It costs you nothing and see what happens. You know, kind of like fishing. You know, they don't call it catching. They call it fishing. You got to throw lines in the water. That's right. So, you know, you know, so I encourage kids to do that. It it really takes very little time and effort to do that. And it's something that may help them. No, I I agree with you, man. Everything you're saying is on point because I have a kid, uh, Sam Chitty, that's out at uh, Bucknell University out there in central Pennsylvania. And he was asking Mm -hmm. me, uh, did I have any kids out here the other day? This is a kid that I used to train in high school. And when he comes home for the summers, we still train. So I told him I had a few from our 7v7 team. 
And uh, this kid has over 3.7 GPA and he sent me the questionnaire. I sent the questionnaire to the kid and he filled it out and now he's in the system. And then when Sam comes home in May, they're going to get a chance to meet and Sam will be able to to direct that information or what he learns about this kid Trace, you know, um, to his coaching staff. You know, one of the things that uh, you also talked about is the timeline, how everything is pushed up. What, What did you mean by that, coach? Yeah, no problem. The, so uh, let, me, let me start this one with, this is, a, this is a true story about a kid that I had at Hargrave. So earlier in this podcast, I mentioned the Hargrave experience. And yes. We had a, we had a kid, so I, I, I was the offense coordinator and I was the strength and conditioning coordinator for the school, Hargrave, and it was filled with complete dudes. I mean, every guy, you know, there was about five to 10 future NFL kids on the, on these teams, guys that played, you know, they're still playing. Um, one of them is Brandon Flowers. He's an all pro corner. Um, he was on this team. Uh, so th- there was guys, dudes everywhere. And <laughs> we had, we had a kid. Um, his name was, was Keith Saunders. And he didn't, he came to us from New Jersey. I don't remember if it was an academic issue or not. And, um, but he came to Hargrave for this prep year. And he was playing tight end for us. Um, he was a natural defensive end, but our the entire starting 11 on defense were committed already to Division One universities, and they were just academic guys. They needed to get their grades up. Um, so they were essentially reclassing. This is back in the day. Now, now again, Hargrave is no longer around. The program is no longer around because um, I just think the NCAA cracked down on, on some of these things, on the reclassification prep schools and stuff like that. But Keith was there, and he was a great kid. He was at, a, I think, Camden, New Jersey. Tough kid, tall, about 6'3 and a half, 6'4", about 230 pounds. Really, really good athlete. And we get through the season and nothing's really happening for him. Um, You know, he's getting his grades right and everything, but there's not a lot of movement from a recruiting standpoint. We get to March and it's still not a lot going on. We get to April and teams, division one schools are coming in and trying to clean up their recruiting. So we became a place where, you know, if they had a receiver on the board that, you know, the number one receiver in the country and Virginia Tech was recruiting him and they didn't get him and they needed another guy to replace him, they often would stop by our place because we had dudes everywhere. So in comes Alabama on the very last day of recruiting. And this is the former Alabama under Shula. This is prior to Saban. Saban, I believe, was at Michigan State at the time. Right. Or may have, or yeah, he was at Michigan State. So a coach comes in from Alabama and says, comes down to the football area and comes down to the weight room and says, I need a D end. Do you have any unsigned D ends that are dudes? And of course, you know, we got dudes everywhere. Even our backups were division one guys. And we're like, I said, yeah, actually, well, we got this tight end who's a very, very athletic guy. And he played defensive end in high school, but he's a really good athlete. And he said, Where's he at? (laughs) So I said, he's down in the weight room. So he comes down in the weight room and I'm hanging out with this coach from Alabama and we're watching this kid work out. You can't talk to him yet. And we're watching him work out and the kid's just doing the workout. I wrote him and, or that, you know, that I had posted on the board and he's going through it and sweating and working hard. Doesn't even notice we're there. The coach says, Hey, I'm going to go upstairs and get his transcripts. When he's done his workout, will you send him up? Sure. So we sent him up uh, after he's done his workout, and I'm sitting down in the in the weight room cleaning up, getting getting ready for my next group of guys. And Keith comes back down about 20 minutes later with this huge smile on his face, and I'm asking him like, you know, what happened, man? And he's like, I just got offered by Alabama, <laughs> and I was like, awesome, man, congratulations. He's like, so I, I'm done. I can leave. I'm like, yeah. So. He, he waited his time and he, you know, he, he, he did everything he needed to do. And of course he 
wanted to be offered like at the same time as everybody else. Right. But for him, his, his path led to being offered by Alabama on the very last day of signing. Mm. And he, he, was, he was still available. And you know what the kid did? He ended up being a three-year starter at defensive end at Alabama. And his last year or two was when Saban was there. Yeah, so, that's incredible, man. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about the timeline, so that timeline of – this is twofold. Number one, the timeline of the of the colleges and when when they're going to offer and how they're going to offer and what you know what you got to do. We as a coach, as a player, have no control over their timeline, and that is a point of um, distress that causes us a lot of stress. Is like, what are they waiting for? Why aren't they offering this kid? You know. Why aren't they offering this kid? He's in state. He's right here. He's a stud. What the heck's going on? We have zero control over it. We have to give up. We have to really like let go of that. Is just know that they're going to offer when they're ready to offer. So that's number one. Number two is that last was it last year? Yes, last season was the first year that they had this early early signing day period in December. That's right. So it was. So it was the very first one. And what happened was the spring before, so two, not last spring, but the spring before, everything started to speed up from a recruiting standpoint. So more and more juniors that were going to be 2019 kids were being off, or excuse me, 2018 kids were being offered earlier because the coaches now had to basically, if you're a power five school, you're filling your class in December instead of in February. So the timeline of recruiting has been pushed up, which means a lot of the top players in the nation ranked at, at their position, everything is sped up. What used to happen in, July, uh, in, in June of their junior year, going into their senior year, those things are now happening. The offers and the, you know, that stuff is now happening earlier. So <clears throat> everything has been pushed up. The timeline has been pushed up by about six months, uh, six to eight months. So again, what, what we, you know, a lot of us coaches that kind of cut our teeth in the old way in the old timeline need to adjust. So your high level division one football player that may be in, on your team or whatever, he's got to kind of get going a little earlier. So right at the end of his sophomore year, he needs to start doing those camps. He needs to be, you know, the recruiting process is going to start, um, like I said, about six months earlier for them now. Um, and, you know, it was just somewhere, <laughs> it was just recently I, I saw this post, and again, it, it was a post on Twitter, but the number one, number one or number two, receiver in the nation like couldn't commit to Clemson for this upcoming school you know this upcoming year because they are already full they're already full wow. for their 2020 2020 season you know their 2020 class with commitments it's not even 2020 yet <laughs> and they've already got all 25 of their guys committed or whatever they have it's it's incredible so everything's been pushed up you know uh Speaking of, of, of being pushed up and you've been talking about the timeline and sometimes this, this timeline could get slow or you can be in a longer period of uncertainty when it comes to yes. these recruiting questions. You know, when, yes. co you know, coaches want to know if they do, does he love the rate room? Does he love the weight room? And this, this, yes. this is the biggest one. Are there any issues with the parents? and your staff yes. talk to us about that because you got helicopter parents or you got parents that <laughs> want to maybe overextend themselves that might inadvertently the parent is doing the best they can but could inadvertently let's call it for what it is piss off a coach then that coach could tell more coaches with which could affect the child's recruiting process yes 100 percent. and i know this is one of those things that could rub people the wrong way but i don't care you need to hear it because as a parent, you need to hear this because you don't under, a lot of people don't understand how they play a part in this. They just think it's all about the kids and the coaches and the program. And in reality, they're not, you know, when a, when a school is going to invest 
$250,000 in your child, you know, over a four year period in tuition, they're not, they're not just going to throw that money around to some random kid. Like they need to, that they need to make a wise investment. And the way it's looking right now is, is there's a lot more in-depth questioning going on about the kid and his family. They want to know what kind of person they're getting. And they're not just recruiting the kid anymore. They're, you know, if they know they're, they're, in, they're actually recruiting a person, it's not just a football player they're looking for. They want, a, you know, they're recruiting the complete person in your child, which also means because he's a minor, they're recruiting the family and they know that family is going to be around. And so the question has come up a lot to me during the recruiting process is, you know, what, what's the family situation look like, you know, and they want to know, they want to know, is it a, you know, two, two parent family? Is it a split family? Do they get along? Are they allowed to be in the stadium together at the same time? <laughs> right. um, you know, is it, you know, is, is it a single mom, single dad type of thing? Like they want to yeah. know. So they know how to communicate effectively with these, with the kid and his family. But they also ask questions like, you know, have you had any negative experiences with the family? And that just raised red flags to me is, yo, you, it's, if you got, you know, the crazy mom that's in the stands yelling and screaming, like that could be really bad for your kid. You know, the one that's like talking smack about the coaches, that's bad. No yes. college wants that. And they're not going to, that's gonna, just going to be trouble. It's going to lead, especially with the loosening of the transfer rules in college with the portal and all that. Yeah, they don't want that. They don't want that at all. So I think it's important that families understand that and that be on your best behavior. Um, we actually had a, uh, a Mac school on our sideline one night um, watching, you know, watching the game. Guy flew in from Ohio and came in and watched the game and they were going to recruit one of our kids when, when it was an appropriate time to talk to him, of course, but he wanted to be there. And, you know, of course, I welcome them, welcome anybody and welcome those coaches to come and watch our practice and whatever they want to do, you know, whatever's going to help the kid. So we're in this, we're in a game with a team who we ended up, they were, they ended up being the number one seed in the playoffs and we were the number two seed. We ended up beating them in the state championship, but we opened the season with them. Okay. So we're, <laughs> this coach is, uh, on our sideline and the place is going nuts. I mean, it was the game of the year. The opening game, the opening game of the season was unbelievable. And it was a little testy, you know, it was a little, you know, a lot of emotional things going on and the crowd was a little emotional too. And you know how that can be. And the guy, (laughs) the coach, the division one coach is standing there on the sideline. He's like, he asked one of my assistants, uh, actually one of the get back coaches, he asked him, yo, whose mom is that? Or whose dad is that? <laughs> and, the, and the coach was like, oh, not one of our kids. Or, you know, oh, he's a JV, you know, uh, JV kid's parent. He was like, my God. Like, if that was the kid, the kid's parent who he was there to, to, to recruit, he might have gone home. The guy was, you know, the guy was out of control in the stands and yelling and screaming at the coaching staff and yelling and screaming at the kids. And that Division One coach is standing there watching it. And making notes, you know, taking notes in his brain is I'm not recruiting that kid's that, that parent's kid. No way. So I think it's important that they understand that uh, the families and kids understand that you're, you're not just recruiting, being recruited as a player, you're being recruited as a person and they're not going to take problem child. They're not going to take problem families because especially the good schools, they don't need to. You think Alabama need, you think Alabama needs to take this, you know, this linebacker who's, you know, or this, this O lineman who's, you know, mom is a maniac in the stands. They don't need him. They'll just go get the other guy. So you can definitely hurt, hurt your chances of being recruited by allowing that sort of behavior to go on and not controlling yourself. So that's very real. And it's not just a, a head coach kind of trying to throw idle threats out there. I'm telling you that you will hurt your child's recruiting by doing that. You know, um, 
speaking of ways that you can enhance your recruiting, you know, there's camps. And, you know, when the summer comes, you only have so many, you know, days or so much time to go to these different camps, depending on where the distance, it, the distance or the location is. But, you know, yes. you mentioned that uh, one school told you that 75 percent of all of their commits get offered in camp. So, uh, you know, speak to us about that, coach. Yeah, absolutely. The the easiest, the, the best way, if any athletes are listening, the best way to get recruited. Um, Obviously, you got to have great film. So, you know, the film is important. We'll touch on that later, I believe. But in, if, if you haven't received the offers that you're looking for or you're, or you're close, you know, you're being recruited by a, te- by a school, but they haven't offered yet, what better way to, to force the issue, to prove to them that you're worthy of an offer than to go to, go to their camp, go to their junior day camp, so if you're a class of 2020 kid, you're going to be doing that starting May 26th this year, I believe, is the first date where a school can have can host camps. From May 26th to about the end of July, the schools will host one-day junior day camps, prospect camps. And you'll run around and do, you know, the old spandex football stuff and right. 7 and dr- drills and stuff. And I could speak on that, too, but I, I'm, I'm going to hold my opinion on that but um (laughs) but if you if you go if you go to this camp and you whoop everybody's butt and they were kind of on the fence about offering you you know what's going to happen if you if your measurables are there Mm -hmm. and you run well you run well you're in shape that's that's another aspect of this i'll talk about in a second um once you get through the measurables part you go out there and perform and if you perform well and you're the top linebacker in camp, guess what's going to happen? They're going to offer you if they need a linebacker. They're going to offer you a scholarship on the spot because they're allowed to. And it happens all the time. Like I said, that one school, just not just one, but one in particular, gave me the, the, those statistics is that 75% of their commits last year had attended their camp and were offered on their camp day. They weren't offered prior to it. They got offered in their June camp and they ended up committing to that university. So those offers that you're going to get at camp are probably more likely going to be a committable offer. And because they've seen you in person, they they finally got to see you up close and personal. And if they continue to offer you or they offer you after they see you in person and perform, then it's real. That's a real offer that is committable. Um, if they've never seen you up close and personal, then you got to wonder, is that off for real? Right. So the camp circuit, yeah, the camp circuit is critical, critical in recruiting today. You can't just stay home and just expect to get offered. Some kids do just because they're genetic freaks and their film is that good. But the reality is for most kids, they're going to need to get them to go to a camp. And this includes now, Division two and FCS schools as well. No, I, so, I understand, Coach, because we have a kid that uh, he didn't grow up playing linebacker, but he's a wrestler. So he spent a, uh, okay. his first two and a half years playing like D line and nose guard because he's just that aggressive and he's quick. But you're talking about six yeah. foot. 225, 230 pounds. Now he has to move in space. And uh, his former coach told me, and this is the thing that's going mm-hmm. on around here. If Portland State doesn't offer you, why is any other big sky school going to offer you or or Division One school? So he has to go. We've told him you have to go forget going to Boise State, forget not and not right. to knock Boise State, but go to right. Go to where this camp, they like you. You're in their database. They're, they ask you, right. how, you're, how, how are you doing from month to month? So I've told him and his mom, it's in your backyard. It's relatively inexpensive. You have to go mm-hmm. kill the, and dominate this Portland State camp. That, that's yeah, no doubt. Business. So you're, you're right on point. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think the, the advice that you guys are giving him is very sound. That is exactly what needs to happen. And you made the point is that, if Portland State hasn't offered him, 
then why would Boise State offer him? Why would you know Montana offer him? They're not. Exactly. They're not going to offer not. him. They're waiting. They're waiting to see who offers them. And that's that's a whole other caveat to this is, you know, oftentimes one school takes a chance, if you would, and, you know, finds the diamond in the rough and offers the kid. And then the dam breaks and there's a flood of offers. But it takes that one. And if it's like, let's say an ACC school offers a kid, well, it's not just going to be one ACC school that offers them. It's going to end up being three or four. You know, and at, we, we had, again, my guard that's going to Penn State, he got an offer. His first SEC offer was from Kentucky. Kentucky kind of came out of nowhere, found his film, called me, did recruited him hard and recruited him right. Like they did a great job and they, they really, really wanted him. Well, as soon as Kentucky offers him, guess who comes strolling in? Tennessee. Tennessee wants to offer him, you know, and then other SEC schools want to offer him. And it's like, <clears throat> yeah, that's great, but Kentucky was the one that took the chance. That's right. Got the ball rolling. So if you're a, if you're an athlete and you're waiting, you're waiting for that big offer because you feel you can play at, in the Pac-12 or whatever. Uh, stop waiting. Go to a camp. Go to a camp that is interested in you. Like they need to know you. You know they need to know who you are beforehand. Maybe it's the camp that of the school that's been sending you the mail and you've been talking to, but there hasn't been any offer. And they said, Hey man, you should come to our camp. Guess what? That's take the hint. You know, they're not, you're, you're 50 bucks. They're making, uh, you know, you're paying to go to the camp or whatever is not gonna, you know, it's not like, it's not like a, uh, free money to them. I mean, it's barely anything. The coaches aren't making any of that. So if they're saying, we'd love for you to come to camp, take that hint is saying, we want to see you up close and personal. So if you perform good, we're going to offer you. And, you know, and if you get that offer, the other equitable equal schools, equal level wise, are probably going to take a look at you too. So when it comes to camps, it's critical for the kids. It's really the way. It's the way to get recruited now is you have great film, your scores and your, your test scores and your GPA match the level that you can get into the match your level of play and then you go to the camp and you perform well and they offer you and then the other schools don't need to offer or don't need to see you at camp now they're going to offer you too you know hey this kid got this kid got offered at virginia's junior day camp well virginia tech will probably offer him now you know so it's it's um you know, out your way, maybe it's Washington and Washington state. Maybe they're the competitive, you know, they're always trying to pick each other's guys. Yeah. You know, they can, they all compete (laughs) of course. Right. Right. So like if you get an offer from Washington state, then you best believe that Washington is going to be looking at you. So that's critical. And again, the, the camp dates start this, this year on May 26th and last through July, most of them are done, um, in June. So you only have so many weekends as a family and as a player. So this is the other part to this is if you're going to go camping, which you should be, it's uh, and do the circuit. It's important that you spend your time wisely and manage your money during this thing. Yes, there's a minor cost, but is 50 bucks or 75 bucks to go to a camp worth a $250,000 offer? I think so. So if, uh, you know, I, I highly encourage families to come up come up with it and figure it out maybe instead of paying some guy to train you at that point of the year maybe you just hold off on the training yeah keep that money keep that money and go use it you know for academics (laughs) which is going to be a huge investment you know well you know go save that money to go camp to go to a camp instead um but you got to pick the right camps too so you know, if, if you're out on the West Coast and you're not getting a ton of interest from, let's say, Wisconsin, but you really want to go to Wisconsin, well, it's going to be a waste of your time to go to that camp most likely. There's going to be a high likelihood they don't offer you because they don't, they're not recruiting you. So don't waste your time and your money going to that camp. Go to a camp that is more likely you're going to land something off of. And that includes... FBS schools, FCS, and Division Two. Yeah, if you're a Division Two football. 
Go ahead. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. Because if you're not getting recruited by Oregon, you might want to go to the Portland state, the Eastern Washington. We have central Washington right. out here. That's division two. Western Oregon is division two now also. Right. So, like everything you're saying is on point coach. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, 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 it's part of being a wise investor in your kid, you know, like don't, don't sell them the pipe dream of where we're going to fly out to Florida state and go to their camp. Like, no, man, unless they're telling you, please come out here. Don't go there. They don't, they don't, they're not going to recruit you. Um, so it, it's, you need to be smart with your money and your time. And I would say if I had to, you know, cause this comes up a lot is my kids, for example, you know, which camp should I go to? Well, Let's pick a dream camp, right? Let's pick a camp where they know who you are. They know you're a good player, but they haven't offered you. Let's pick one of those and go to it and try to kick some butt. See what happens. And if nothing happens from that, if you don't get an offer that day, then start to schedule the, the, you know, the next step down. Maybe not a power five school. Maybe go to a one group of five school that you can get to. Um, you know, We're talking like a MAC conference of uh, – right you know, uh, one of those, like a Mountain West conference or something like that. Yes. Go to that school. And if you do well and you get an offer, great. If you don't, okay, now start going down, picking the FCS schools. Because if I've been to a power five school and they don't want me, I've been to a group of five school and they don't want me. Well, damn, maybe somebody in the FCS wants me. So again, like I kind of said, fishing, you got to throw a lot of lines in the water. And if you keep trying to, you know, fish in the same spot, not catching, then it's fruitless labor. You know, you're doing, you're wasting your time.